The following is a presentation of the Retro Network. Remember that show back then. Remember that show. Turn on the TV, time was always flying. Why did they have to end? So many shows you forgot Hey there, TV lovers, and welcome to episode three of Remember That Show. I'm Adam Pope. And I'm William Bruce West. And for this installment of the show, we find ourselves changing the channel to something spooky. Because it's Halloween! Which means our primetime frights might be interrupted any minute by trick-or-treaters at the door, or a barrage of eggs from kids who didn't like the box of raisins we dropped in their treat bag. That's right. So before another drugstore knockoff, Jason Voorhees shows up to demand a fun-sized Twizzlers, we've got to jump into our first segment, theme song, where we share a bit of our childhood histories with TV. Though for this episode, it feels more appropriate to call it our Scream Song. Adam, do you have a favorite Halloween TV watching memory or spooky TV broadcast from the 80s, 90s that you watch every year? Well, so here's the thing, right? The holiday specials that I was tuning in for, it was always Christmas. That was like where I was paying attention. I love my Frosty the Snowman and stuff like that. But when it came to Halloween, I, I think I was just too busy filling my pillowcase, you know, with candy. Like I, I didn't have time to sit at home watching TV. But in high school, so this is still the 90s, I went to see the band Kiss on Halloween night, 1998, Dodger Stadium. Now, while I was at the concert, the Fox Network was running a night of Kiss-themed programming and cutting to Aries Spears and Nicole Sullivan from Mad TV. They were at the concert while it was going on live, interviewing random fans and stuff. And also on that night, the members of the band were making cameos on an episode of Millennium. Ah, remember Millennium? Lance Hendricks in there, so but they were out of makeup for that one. They were not kissed. They were playing actual characters on the show. Like Paul Stanley gets killed in the opening segment, you know, but they also appeared as kiss on mad TV in several sketches. Like one where they were like life-size action figures. One where Phil Lamar was Michael Jackson. It was kiss versus Michael Jackson. who was like murdering people on the set of mad TV. It was weird. Anyway. So I missed the broadcast that night. Cause I was at the concert, but later, like five years later, I was able to track down a bootleg DVD compilation of that whole night of programming. So that is the retro TV watching tradition I have for Halloween. I watch my DVD copy of the full concert. Then I watch the Fox DVD and just take in all those shows. And then if I have time, Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park, which was the TV movie they made in 1978 that premiered the week of Halloween. Uh, so you know, I have a copy of that too that I'll throw in. But I'm curious for you, Will, what do, what do you go to for Halloween? Oh, that's a good question. Well, first off, I'm glad you mentioned Aerie Spears because he's actually the most famous person to follow me on Twitter until he got banned from Twitter. So, <laughs> <laughs> not by you, okay. <laughs> not by me, but it was a short-lived thing I could be proud of. Um, my favorite Halloween tradition, oh boy, that's a hard one. Like, whenever we get into Halloween season, I get more into sci-fi, which is like spooky adjacent, you know? And I think it's because like, I was really big into, I mean, we're here. I was big into like syndicated Saturday shows. And I remember like in my formative years, that's when like the Outer Limits came back and you had Poltergeist, The Legacy, which had nothing to do with 
with the Poltergeist franchise. Hopefully we'll get to that eventually. So I was really into crappy syndicated horror, but that was like all I could handle. I'm not really into like the franchises like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. I know Roseanne, as we were growing up, that was like a tradition on that show, like the Halloween episode. Like I watched it and it was okay, but like I generally get into like spooky sci-fi mode as we head towards Halloween. That's interesting. Okay, well then let me ask you this. Is Halloween a big holiday for you and what was your favorite halloween costume you wore as a kid or were you out there trick-or-treating it was like i was really into halloween i mean there were years i did the whole ben cooper you get the mask and the plastic smock that says the name of your character on it. it's like <laughs> optimus prime doesn't have transformers written across his chest but <laughs> that's so like grandmas knew who you were when you knocked on their doors like i did those costumes i was tweety bird one year i was snoopy i was mr t i was sergeant slaughter i was like i did all those like mask in a box costumes until those were like outlawed for being flammable or whatever and then i went through the whole like phase of oh mcdonald's gave us face paint so i'll be a ghost this year or i made a starfleet uniform out of an old sweatshirt like we never really invested money in like costumes but i was always like creative like i was always building gadgets and stuff out of like constructs <laughs> and stuff like that so like i always had something for halloween and it was it was a big deal to me but like i think two things happened to me where like first off my mom had me late i think we've talked about that before but she's also gotten like really religious like she was kind of religious then but like really religious to the point where like she turns off the lights now on halloween so nobody nobody comes to the door so like she shut halloween down once i was like of age and then after college you know like you start to realize that halloween is only fun if you're a kid or if you're young single and drunk and i'm neither of those at this point <laughs> So now it's just the kind of thing of like, I watch my kids enjoy it, but like, I, I sound like a curmudgeon. Halloween holds almost like I'm a Grinch with Halloween now. Like I'm waiting for that spark to be lit inside of me where I embrace it again. But I'd say for the past decade, Halloween's just kind of like, eh, well, candy will be cheap the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, maybe this will spark it for you. We'll see how it goes. I mean, yeah, Halloween has always been huge for me. My mom would make my costumes most years you know i was like Burman one year i was pinocchio i was peter pan like I, i've had all these you know different costumes but it's kind of interesting when i think back the the costume that stands out to me the most was memorable because i made it myself and i never outlived the imposter syndrome from that because i would take my costume so seriously most years i was like nine years old so it's like 1991 and our community you know our neighborhood would have these events for kids and, and they, would, they would be called the clubhouse you know this little area you would gather in and they do different things movie nights and we'd watch a movie get popcorn whatever but they did a halloween costume contest i didn't know it was a costume contest that was the thing they said we're having a halloween party everybody come we'll do some games we'll do some candy so i showed up and i wasn't wearing a costume and i saw these kids in costume i was like oh i didn't get the memo there was like a girl she had red hair she had freckles so she was pippy long stocking she had you know a wire hanger in her hair with braids over it so it stuck out perfectly like it was just like wow the kids are going all out so i was like but they're doing a costume contest and i want to win i don't want to run all the way home and get a costume so all i had on was an orlando magic baseball hat that i got i didn't even know they were a basketball team at the time i was not a sports kid it just said magic and had a star on it and that's why i picked it up from a garage sale that's why i wore an orlando magic hat i didn't know who Shaq was i didn't know anybody and so I turned it backwards. And when they said, okay, our next contestant. Oh, Adam, what do you got for us? 
Well, my name is Adam P. And I'm here to say, I like eating candy in a major way. And I just, I improved a rap and everybody clapped. And then I sat down. So time comes for the awards. Of course, Pippi Longstocking Girl is going to be the number one choice. You know, she won this thing. Some other kid gets third place. And then they called me up for second place. And the guy, his name was Pat. I'll never forget his introduction. He's like, and second place goes to Adam as a rapper. <laughs> and he gave me a five dollar bill that was my prize and it just i felt so bad all these kids who were actually there in costume and i just like you know was faking it and that was a life lesson if you have the enthusiasm and you act like you're supposed to be there i've gotten a lot of things accomplished that way <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome Oh, so, but it was so grandmaster b like it was a hundred yes that's what i was gonna say <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but but that was like, I, I've never been able to forget that moment because I was just like, this is wrong. <laughs> and that day, Adam learned about cultural appropriation. <laughs> exactly. It's just like, it was so 1991. That's what we were doing. Every kid, anywhere. You, you do a rap and it's this type of rap. This is how yep. it starts. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, I think it's time to move on from my secret shame. And <laughs> let's get into the show for this episode. Well, Skelevator Pitch. Our topic for this episode is an obscure 80s cartoon called Mini Monsters, which was part of a mostly forgotten syndicated cartoon package called The Comic Strip, produced by Rankin Bass. It was actually the final TV series from the animation company, which created all those stop-motion Christmas specials from the 1960s forward. The comic strip was made up of a rotating group of cartoon shorts that included Karate Cat, which was like Hong Kong Fooey, but he sounded like Rodney Dangerfield. There were Street Frogs, about hip-hop rapping frogs that have not aged well. Tiger Sharks, the only segment anyone remembers because it was Underwater Thundercats, which Rankin Bass also created, along with Silverhawks, and Many Monsters, which we're here to talk about today. Adam, how often did you watch the comic strip growing up? Um, I would say not as often as I wanted to, because I, I'm pretty sure it aired on Channel 13 KCOP in our area, which later became our UPN affiliate. So it tells you what kind of programming they were running. They were always buying like the C-level syndicated packages, you know, like it, it might have been a current cartoon, but it was not top tier. But I would watch as often as I could, but it wasn't. It was another one of those things, syndicated TV, the time slots weren't dependable always. And so a lot of times, like, I just, I would think it was going to be on, then it wasn't on. Or, or now it's on in the afternoon, or now it's on in the morning. Like, so I, it was hit and miss, but all the shows really made an impression on me. I would say all of them except for Karate Cat, because that is the worst show. Like, it was, it was just so lame, and I never liked Karate Cat. <laughs> How about you? Did you catch it on, on the regular or what was the story for you? Um, Not regularly. I was never home for it. It aired in D.C. on WDCA 20. That was also our UPN station later on. But it aired early in the afternoon. This was like a year or two before Disney afternoon. So it started at like, let's say 2 p.m. So I only saw it on sick days. But then also, like you were saying, I only cared about Tiger Sharks. I've said before that I have no real affinity for like He-Man and Thundercats and all that stuff because I wasn't home for it. Like I just, I was never around to watch it. But Tiger Sharks was kind of like, I felt like I was getting in on the ground floor of something. You know, it was kind of like, like, well, I missed Silverhawks and Thundercats, but Tiger Sharks, this, this underwater thing, that's going to take off. So I thought that like I was really doing something, but I didn't realize I had missed Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and I had jumped on the 98 degrees train <laughs> and it just wasn't going to reach the same heights <laughs> as those other two. Oh man, yeah. Unfortunately, we, I mean, we may cover Tiger Shark somewhere down the road, but I don't even know if it's worth it because if you watch it now it doesn't justify anything it doesn't set up anything literally the bad guys say well i believe we have something in common what's that evil 
and, and they just they're literally they say they're evil just to be evil like they didn't take the time to make any type of reason why anybody is even there like they're called the tiger sharks already before they're ever introduced to how they transform uh, what does tiger sharks mean why are you a group what do you do like there's just there's nothing there in that first episode especially so yeah it, tiger sharks was cool because you're like oh but he's now he now he's a shark man that's cool you know the walrus guy less cool but octopus girl kind of cool <laughs> she's no chitara but yeah so anyway yeah I definitely i i feel you there but we're here to talk about mini monsters let me give you the premise here it was about a brother and sister named sherman and melissa they were sent away to a sleepaway summer camp by their parents because they were acting like monsters at home but they sent them to camp minimon which was a camp for literal monsters which they did not understand so the creators of the show i feel like took about as much time to name the characters as they did to order lunch that day because there's a little vampire his name is Draki, and a friendly frankenstein monster named frankie and a wiseacre wolf kid named wolfie he's like the fozzy of the group you know a goofy gill boy named lagoon like creature from the black lagoon a macho mummy named mummo an invisible kid named Blanco, <laughs> a lumbering lizard who doesn't say much named Klutz. There's Merlin's son, Melvin, and a witch girl named Jinx. Now, the camp director is this organ playing ghoul. You never see him outside of a silhouette created by the moon, even when it's daytime. There's a silhouette. I assume it's supposed to be the sun, but it looks like the moon still. You know, it's always there. It's got a little vulture with him. But there, there, this just keeps going. There are so many characters. There's a crow named Caulfield. He's like the prototype for Virgil from the Mighty Max cartoon by way of Zazu from The Lion King. He's somewhere in between. There's a nerdy camp counselor named Gary. He's, again, he's kind of like Ugg from Salute Your Shorts, maybe, you know, with Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. So... There's there's a lot to work with here. There's a lot to keep track of. Will, just starting off here, if you had to pick the most memorable character design or character for another reason from this huge lineup, who would it be? Oh boy. Um, the thing that the one that stood out to me the most is a popular trope from the 80s, and that was the mysterious faceless masked parents. You know, you've got your Dr. Claw, you've got your nanny, you've got it's all wrapped up in one. Like we never see Sherman and Melissa's parents. Um, Sherman's mom we see is sitting in a chair with her back to you and she's knitting, and then the dad is reading the newspaper. And that's just them. He never puts the paper down. She never puts the knitting down. And it's just kind of this thing from that era. There's always like an adult you can't see. It feels like one of those things that if you interviewed the production team, they just say like, oh, we didn't feel like designing them, you know? But like it lets the audience's imagination run wild a little bit. I'm sitting there watching like, I wonder if their parents are monsters and we don't know it, but they kind of know it, which is why they would go to Camp Mini Mon. It's like, yeah, it was in the classifieds, but it would be a nice little twist if like at the end of the 65 episodes, because yes, there were 65 episodes of this, that he would finally put the paper down and he'd be like an alien or something and she would put down the knitting and she'd have like one eye you know like that would be a nice little like twist to cap things off so honestly the most memorable ones were the parents because the monsters i watched the pilot a couple times while i was working and i noticed that you can't really tell the characters apart at least from an audio perspective because whoever was doing the voices was really married to this like like 50s New York tough accent, you know? It's like everybody was Frankie Valley to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the, the, it didn't fit the character designs to me that, that is true yeah they definitely had a sensibility in that way and to your point you know about not seeing the parents or the adult that you don't see their face like i have in my mind what nanny from muppet babies looks like you know we only ever saw like you know from her waist below but like in my mind i know what she looks like but it's obviously wrong <laughs> or is it right because it was meant to be for everybody all, every one of us who we want it to be but now, as far as this show goes, though, when I think about it, if I were a tattoo getting person, which I am not, if I needed something for my left butt cheek, it would be Mummo. Mummo the Mummy Kid. Why? 
Okay, he's a mummy, and he's got one eye that pokes out from between the bandages. You only ever see one eye. But he also has a single boxing glove on one hand. One boxing glove. And that just, like, stood out to me so much. I'm just like, what is this? Of course, years later, I become a big fan of Strong Bad, you know, on HomestarRunner.com. So maybe there's some, you know, played into that years later. Oh, yeah, Momo had a, a boxing glove, too. But yeah, but it's just, it's it's the only one that feels unique among anybody else. It's just like, oh, yeah, they look like the classic monsters. But that one little accoutrement there you know that little accessory that he decided to add was was pretty cool so Mummo's my guy that that's for certain the production notes are like what if mike tyson had a michael jackson fetish <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, it's almost like i don't even know what they're going for is he supposed to be like sylvester stallone if it is it's very light like you can't really get a you know a vibe from him 100 percent. but speaking of the vibe will we want to figure out why did many monsters exist as it is why was this a thing that was put on to tv you know and normally we're talking about giving a show the green light but this time we're going to borrow from stephen king's it and we're going to talk about the dead light Well, the thing you have to understand about the 1980s is that cartoons were multiplying faster than Mogwai's at a car wash. Uh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Animation was big business, used mostly as a means of selling toys and other licensed merchandise to kids that featured the animated stars of Saturday morning TV from one of the three networks. But there were also a ton of syndicated cartoons that were sold as a package of completed episodes to various local TV stations around the country that could be shown whenever their programmers decided they needed to fill a spot in their schedule. The comic strip started in 1987, when this style of series was in full swing. For example, He-Man was a syndicated series, as was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and even DuckTales. TV stations needed more shows, and if it felt like it was a popular subject that kids would tune into, it didn't matter the quality, they would air it. Did you understand syndication as a kid watching TV? I feel like I strangely did, just because you could always tell the difference like you know obviously like if it was on afternoon and it was on a network or saturday mornings or whatever you knew that there was something behind it you didn't know how many episodes there were but like there was there was something about like okay i show up and it's going to be a brand new episode i can count on with the syndicated shows it always felt like it was almost more random and you would see the same episode several times it wasn't as carefully curated you know as to what they needed to show and what order necessarily and so I would always kind of get that vibe. Also, just the syndicated animation always looked slightly different to me. It always, in my mind, it was always more faded. than. My, maybe it's just because the companies that made the syndicated shows, it was the same companies, you know, so their, their style would come through, whether it was Deke or whatever it might be, you know. So, yeah, I, I think I had an idea of, okay, this is like a show that could be anywhere at any time. But I, I don't think I knew the word syndication. What about you? Where did, where did that come into your consciousness? I definitely knew about it for animated shows because you got to remember, we didn't really have Fox Kids yet. That was 1990. I was a charter member of the Fox Kids Club. I left my ID card on an Amtrak one time and I'm still crying about it. Oh. But, so like we didn't have like, yes, NBC and ABC and CBS had their Saturday morning stuff. But as far as weekday afternoons and mornings, it was all syndicated. So I didn't really think about it too much. I think my like realization of syndication came about because of three's company actually there was a moment i remember there's like an episode where they they're like celebrating chrissy and they mention a date and i was doing the math and i was like but that means she would be like 40 something right now and i thought it was kind of like a play where like they were getting together and like every time you saw a rerun it was essentially them putting on that show again 
<laughs> so it it never occurred to me that like oh this was recorded in the 70s and we're still watching it now so like like you could see it was kind of like the the meme from the hangover with the math equations going over my face it's like oh so I'm watching recorded things and that's when like I figured out syndication but for like the animated shows it was all syndication back then <laughs> Yeah, well, it, uh, I thought it was interesting, like, when you say the, you know, delineation between animation and live action, because I think for me, the live action syndication that stood out was something where, okay, we have the new Leave it to Beaver and the new Gidget, and they were always airing back to back, and they looked very similar, and the promos for them were very similar. I was like, oh, okay, so these shows are created by the same company to then be on whatever station they needed to be on, you know, same with, like, Out of This World or any of those, you know, we're just like, right, oh, okay, right. they all seem to have a similar vibe, so, okay, well, but, but as far as why Mini Monsters itself would be part of the comic strip then, part of this syndication package, kids love monsters. I mean, that's just kind of what it comes down to, right? It only makes sense that, you know, they would do that because monsters on cartoons had been popular for decades. Scooby-Doo was a big hit in the 60s with all the criminals posing as monsters, and it just continued. They just did every new iteration of Scooby-Doo, right? Even to this day. The Groovy Ghoulies, which I mentioned on our first episode, had its moment to give kids kids monstrous laughs in the 70s the real ghostbusters that was like the 80s source of ghosts and goblins oh, i gotta do my billy d williams you know so even an imported show like count duckula when that was on nickelodeon it's on you know basic cable that was getting the imaginations of american kids going about horror movies now in the general pop culture though horror movies were big business in the 80s we know that freddy krueger jason Voorhees, huge money maker at the box office for teenagers and little kids like to know what the older kids are doing and emulate that. Elvira's out there promoting beer using her sexy, sassy vampire persona, you know. You got potato chip companies using the classic Universal Monsters as spokes creatures, all of that. The 80s were monster crazy, not to mention the fact that Rankin Bass had produced a stop motion movie called Mad Monster Party in the 60s. So they weren't any stranger to this monster mash style of production. But I'm trying to think, Will, could you name any other monster or supernatural cartoon series that were popular at this era? Yeah, I mean, like you said, that the kids wanted what the adults had. So you had like the Beetlejuice cartoon. And then there was the My Pet Monster, which was completely just to sell the toy. But I know our friend Chad didn't mind. He's probably like <laughs> the biggest fan of that. Then you've got the Ghostbusters showdown with the real Ghostbusters versus the Filmation Ghostbusters. And that was like that era where Filmation kind of had one last gasp before they are like, you guys take the name, you know? So like that that those are the monster things. But also like I, I guess maybe some of these had cartoons, you know, like the toy tie-ins. There were like the supernaturals and in in humanoids and all that kind of stuff. So like those usually had like four episodes that aired every day for three years. <laughs> you know that situation. So yeah, and I think the one that a lot of people know that came a few years later that people might have even confused with mini monsters as they heard us announce this episode is Gravedale High because that was a big deal because it had Rick Moranis playing himself basically, you know, cashing in on his Ghostbusters fame. And it was arguably a better show and it was on a network. I mean, it was like an actual big deal production. So I, I feel like that's another one that some people probably vaguely remember also, but maybe a little bit better than this so yeah it was just like it, it was in the zeitgeist it was everywhere and i think horror and like you know supernatural always has its place in pop culture but it felt like in the 80s and early 90s especially it was really exploding in a big way so Hey everybody, time to take a break from this episode to tell you about our sponsor, HalloweenCostumes.com and the great selection of retro TV costumes available. And we're going to also tell you how you can get 15% off your entire order by using the link in our show notes. So I was on the website today. I was browsing around. I found their plus size elf costume if you want to be Gordon Shubway after a feline buffet. Um, I personally ordered the Inspector Gadget costume a few years ago when my son and daughter went as Rainbow Bright and her 
Super Sprite. So, I mean, we just had a full 80s Halloween. That was great. This year, the Ghostbusters costumes are calling my name since my youngest loves playing with my real Ghostbusters toys. Uh, maybe I'll pull the trigger on an inflatable Stay Puffed. Now, for the ladies, they've got Velma or Daphne from Scooby-Doo or Lily Munster with matching Herman if you want to go the couple's costume route. William, you know, loves his Power Rangers. So for you 90s kids, they've got a fantastic Green Ranger plus the full spectrum of Rangers, even an inflatable Megazord. They've also got all the accessories you need, you know, just to make your costume as authentic as you want it to be. Of course, there's so much more to choose from, including superheroes, movie icons, video game heroes, and more. So follow the link in our show notes today to get 15% off your entire order at HalloweenCostumes.com between now and October 31st. You'll be glad you did. And now, back to the show. Well, <laughs> I think it comes uh, to us to start talking about this show a little bit more. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a horror show. Well, it's a kid's show based on horror concepts. Yeah. So I guess the big question is, did many monsters give us the type of comedic scares we were looking for? Let's find out as we celebrate what the show did right by raising a goblet of blood and toast to our fears. Cheers, fears. It's as close as I could get. I don't know. <laughs> that one's not a great one-to-one -one for our, our spooky segments. But here's what I'll say just to start out. You know, it's ranking them best. The animation is actually pretty decent on this show for the era. Like, they really could have cheaped out and gone Hanna-Barbera or Filmation levels of just choppy, repetitive sequences, just reusing the same animation. But I feel like every episode, I, I know you watch watch mostly the pilot i've hopped around you know to find as many episodes as i could and each one has a unique plot it all the animation is original different angles different you know settings even though it's all on the camp you know uh, most of the time but, th but there's not even like catchphrases or chants that the characters rely on to be like kids remember we say this you know so it at least is functional in a way that's not distracting. So you got to give it that because when they had four segments to produce, they really could have done them all, you know, on the cheap. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It didn't seem like they recycled a lot of animation. It was very of its time, <laughs> you know, like it didn't feel like it was something they brought out of some closet from the 60s. It was appropriate for the 80s, but I think that's the best I can say about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the voice acting because... I would say no voice actor on the show is wholly annoying. They're decent for the level of writing that they were given. It never feels like old vaudeville jokes or they're doing ancient celebrity impressions in a modern kid's cartoon. And do you know who the biggest cast member is on the show that was providing a voice? Seth Green. Yes, Seth Green plays the kid Sherman, but there's one more cast member who goes on to uh, be very memorable with a much more annoying voice than she's using here. Oh, wow. And I give up. So it's actually Janice from Friends. Really? Yeah, is doing one of the voices here. So I just, I just thought that was kind of fun, you know, that we... <laughs> We had two people that we got to see, you know, in more reputable productions, I guess you would say. But what right, do you think about right. the voice acting in general? Well, as the kids say today, they understood the assignment. You know, <laughs> like they they didn't go overboard with the vaudeville or like it didn't feel like the jokes again had been like sitting around and repurposed for this. The voices, all my good stuff segues into a jeer. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm gonna i'm gonna have to like dot 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 there we <laughs> all go. the voices dot 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 all right well, well this is another thing i want to point out because they rotate the main cast each episode which is to say 
they don't overdo it because we've already talked about this. There's a lot of monster kids at this camp. There are so many characters on this show and they don't necessarily try to cram them all into every episode, but like they kind of break off into smaller groups and have their adventures and do things like that. So I found that kind of refreshing that they're like, look, we have plenty of people to pull from, but we don't feel like there's an obligation that we have to give everybody a line every episode or everybody has to have something to do. Be like, okay, you know, maybe Mummo's not in this episode. Maybe Melvin is not showing up, you know, and you're just like, okay, well that that's, I, I like that they had some foresight. We built out a world, we'll use them when we want to use them. Monster labor laws too. <laughs> now, the last thing I wanted to mention is when I pitched this to you, I said it was like Camp Candy meets the Monster Squad. That's what got you in to choose it over Little Dracula. And what of the elements... One of the strange things that I've always found in the Monster Squad is that when they resurrect the Frankenstein's monster in that movie, when he wakes up, he calls Dracula Master. And I'm like, where was that established? Why would Dracula be Frankenstein's master? But in this show, Frankie calls Dracky Boss. Like he's the muscle to a mafia don, and Tracky's voice doesn't play like, and he's like really any overly Italian, overly New York, anything. But that is the vibe. Like Frankie definitely works for Tracky, and he calls him boss all the time. So there's there was something in the air because both of those productions are 1987. Everybody seemed to believe maybe from Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein that Dracula was in control of Frankenstein. So I just thought that was weird. <laughs> I wanted to be like, well, Dracula wears a suit. So of course, but then Frankenstein wears a suit, but Dracula has a cape. So I think we've learned that cape and suit trumps suit by itself. So it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. You're kind of indicating this. I think it's obvious that many monsters lacked bite or a sharp wit. Uh, so I think it's time to show our fangs as we give it some sneers. All right, let's hear it well. Let's get into it. Oh man, it was so bad. <laughs> Even even by like syndication standards, even by 80s syndication standards, man, I had told you before, like I would turn off the comic strip if I didn't see Tiger Sharks. Like if it wasn't Tiger Sharks, then it's like, I'm going to watch Dennis the Menace. Like I just, I don't care about this block at all. But if I had stayed and seen this, like one time is enough. One episode is enough. I just, oh, the, the voices... They're incongruent. They don't match the character designs at all. It's almost like they hired some seasoned, cheap voice actors. And one of them's like, hey, I've been working on these New York accents. Like, I'd really love to give them a shot. And they're like, well, I don't know, George. He's like, come on. The, this one, he looks like he'd be from Brooklyn. Okay, George give it a shot and then they just let him go like I, I turned my back on it and all the characters were kind of like indistinguishable from each other like there are no distinct voices despite the distinct character designs and i think that's to the show's detriment the show is pretty boring like yes. it's got, it has no attitude. It has no point of view. It's just things happening to the characters to move the plot along for that episode. Is it a swimming competition? Okay. So that's what we're doing this episode. Like even like the kids, Sherman and Melissa, they don't have any distinct personalities. They're not really reacting to the weird monsters they're living with. Occasionally they talk about like, oh, I had to eat this, you know, swamp stew and it made me sick or whatever. But they're indistinguishable from each other even. Like their dialogue could just go one to the other like there's no character that is not even like a point of view character but like the Fonzie they have no Fonzie <laughs> there's no Fonzie there's no catchphrases like you were saying there's yeah. no like hook to remember like oh he said the thing you know and it's just like like you're saying Sherman and Melissa are indistinguishable there's a lot of like prototypical stuff going on here. Like I look at this show and I'm like, I could see how someone watched this and ended up with like Gravity Fall. There's a lot that could be done here, but 
I think the format is to his detriment in that these were nine minute shorts. And this is before the age of Adult Swim swooping in saying like, hey, you can tell a whole story in 11 minutes. They hadn't mastered that yet. So like right when the story gets going, it's over. Like they hadn't figured out pacing. And so there's not enough time to latch on to these indistinguishable soulless characters to begin with. Again, we've talked about there are too many characters for what they're doing. You don't need Melvin. You, you don't need Merlin's son when you already have a witch character who can also do magic. Like that, that's redundant. You know, you have Clut who is a mini Godzilla, but he's just kind of like, hur, 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 hur. like he doesn't do anything. You already have Lagoon, who's basically, you know, kind of, an, you know, an amphibious. And he at least at some point gets an episode where he falls in love with a visiting mermaid. So he has a, a little bit of personality there. You see a little bit of his desires. So, okay, Lagoon, you've justified yourself. There's also Caulfield. Caulfield is the raven, basically. You know, Edgar Allan Poe's the raven, but he's confusing because he talks authoritatively like an adult. Like he's definitely an old grandpa type guy, but he hangs out with the campers, but he's also in charge of nothing, but he talks like he should be. So that confused me a lot. Like, why is he here? Why, why is there an old man camper, you know, in the mix? He He's the screech from the new class, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like, what? Are you in college still? Like, is this work study? Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what about the theme song? It felt like some public domain circus music that they threw some lyrics on at the last minute. It's like, there's nothing distinguishable about this. Like, there's a reason it's forgot. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's you know, one of four, but also didn't do its best to stand out in any way. So that being the case, I mean, this show was kind of dead in the water before it even uh, got a chance to swim. But we're going to do what we can. We say there there's a basic premise here that maybe we could do something with. We got to resurrect it. So we're being called in as the show, Dr. Frankenstein's. A stretch, a stretch. <laughs> All right, Will. So you were teasing earlier. You had an idea. What would you do to make mini monsters work? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> First off, I'd change the format. We can't do the nine minute shorts. It's got to be a standard 22 minute series just so we have real estate to work with. Then the biggest issue I have is that... Even though these monsters are common visuals, I always come back to the fact that in pop culture land, that's the dumbed down version, we always come back to thinking of them as the universal monsters because universal has whatever, I don't know if it's like trademarks or rights. I don't know how that works. I've never really understood that. It's like you can have the creature, but if he's from the Black Lagoon, then suddenly you got lawyers emailing you, you know, like that kind <laughs> of thing. So one thing it desperately needs is it needs to be tied to something. It can't float free as just like, here are these vaguely recognizable monsters because I always feel like if you aren't sanctioned by Universal, then you've got great value bootleg monsters running around. Like it always feels that way to me. It felt that way on Big Bad Beetleboards where they had the monsters hanging out with Flabber. Even like Monster Squad to some extent. So I need it to be Universal Presents <laughs> mini monsters you know that way they can actually like i don't know it gives them an air of legitimacy that brings in parents because your parents and your grandparents grew up with the universal monsters and then they find out like oh there's this cartoon spinoff of that thing i'm familiar with well let me sit down and watch it with you but nobody cares about just like unsanctioned syndicated mini monsters you know so I need it tied to something, even if not universal, then tie it to Monster Squad. They came out 
roughly the same time. Like Monster Squad came out in August. This came out in September, same year. You could have sat on this show for a year and then had it be that like these kids kind of knew the kids from the movie and now they're hanging off with like hanging out at camp with like the offspring of tangentially related monsters to the Monster Squad. Like I need it tied to an existing property just so like it has legs. Nothing feels special about this. So I need like a toy tie-in, even if it was one of those 80s cartoons designed just to sell toys. That's what 90% of them were. There's no real motivation behind this other than hey the kids love monsters it's never gross it's never scary it's got no attitude i think you're right there and that's why to piggyback on what you're saying here i would jump on that and say yes let's get some familiar faces in there but i think we have to go bootleg just because history has shown us that these studios had a hard time collaborating with their characters what i think we need to say is stop looking to the past with the classic monsters. And let's reflect on what was hot in horror in the 80s at that moment. Capture the zeitgeist, right? So I would introduce, if we were doing just say a season two, if not an entire relaunch, a new group of campers from Camp Slash a lot. And they are fashioned after the horror icons of the day. So you got like Nicky Knives would be the Freddy analog. Hockey Harry would be Jason. You got Polly Pincushion as Pinhead. Sammy Shape would be michael myers and so on you know so you have like these kind of slasher characters that kids are seeing in the costume shops they're seeing the trailers on tv for the movies they know their older brother has fangoria in their room you know and then what's going on is the camp director for this group has bought out Camp Minimon and his name is Norman and his mother is his partner in the business and you only ever see the mother making announcements from the window of their cabin on the hill when Norman isn't around. <laughs> and then we dump everyone from the old cast. Just get rid of them except for Sherman. So we got one human kid. We got Mummo and Blanco, the invisible kid, because invisible is cool. You could do something with that. And they're going to be the trio who are reacting to the hijinks of this new class of troublemakers who are definitely, you know, trying to be scary or trying to be gross or whatever. And I feel like this series, you said 65 episodes, you know, or it's segments, you know, like you say, they're nine minutes, but th- we want them to go out of the camp. We want them to do more. So maybe they go to town and they harass the townies. Sure. But what about a horror convention where they're normal or they're celebrated? Or what about a video store? They're going to choose their video to watch for the camp movie night even they go to nikki knives dream dimension you know why not it just really pushed new line hey you want to sue us or not again you want to capture the feeling of the moment they have to have some montages set to music by hair metal bands who had done music for different horror movies you know get docket get wasp or slaughter or whoever else you know so you get these hair metal bands and you definitely want to have a hair metal theme song we got to ditch the old theme song you know so just really like just grab what was happening for that moment for as long as it can last get as close as you can without getting sued but I think that's what the kids would tune in there they're like did you see the Freddy cartoon there's a Freddy cartoon and then everybody be talking about it it's the one we can watch because it's on TV we're allowed to you know but what do you think about that I like it but let me meet you in the middle because I fell down my own rabbit hole because I was so angry at many monsters for being so mediocre (laughs) what I was trying to do and I think it could work well with your concept but like i keep coming back to it needs to be buoyed to something existing but i'm also i'm going for the franchise baby i want multi-generational so what i would do you sold this to me as camp candy meets the monster squad and i took that to heart so what i would do is insert a star a horror star a star who means spooky. And I would rebrand this as Vincent Price's mini monsters. And you remember that that organist who you only see in silhouette? Well, guess who that is? Vincent Price. And then the rest we can have the Nicky Knives and all that because we'll make our deals with New Line or 
not and just see if they call us. But we need that pillar of the community. We can't have Elvira because she's too boobly and she's also too big for that during this time. But Vincent Price is kind of winding down. It's post thriller, <laughs> you know, like I think he'd do it. It doesn't require much on his behalf. He can just sit in a chair. Maybe he does some intros to the cartoon and live action, but we need to make it an institution. I think you're right. Yeah, we definitely needed a name. And he is the one, like you say, it's it's going to reach across, you know, the generational divide, kids of the 80s. Oh, my parents know Vincent Price's House of Wax, right? Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so that I think that would that would really go a long way to add just that slight tinge of legitimacy. It was never going to be a major hit, but good enough, right? Right, right, right. You'd at least be able to find videotapes of it these days. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's the thing. Each of these segments from the comic strip did get a single VHS release with three episodes of each one. They go for a lot of money these days, so because they're they're pretty rare. Actually, I should say they did make Tiger Sharks toys, but they're very rare. Did you know that? I feel like I did. Like yeah. I feel like I've seen them in an old Tomarts, but like it didn't stick with me. I would imagine they are astronomical. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's it was a very low production run for Tiger tiger sharks toys yeah that's for sure but i i think yeah mini monsters definitely one of those shows that deserves to be forgotten they didn't go for it they didn't try anything they just said here's the concept and we're doing it and it's not going to stand out in any way to anyone i even if they try to remember it they're really gonna have a hard time but i like i said i always remembered momo momo <laughs> it's a good design good design could we possibly say since we have nothing to back this up that mini monsters killed Rankin back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I mean, it's pretty close. It, like we said, it was their final production. It was that nail in the coffin. So, <laughs> all right. Well, Will, we're coming out of the Halloween season. We're looking towards next month in November. And I know what we're getting excited to talk about, because you and I said, when we come out of this season, we want to hit them with something special. We want to hit them with something that we're extra passionate about. So why don't you tell them what the next episode's going to be all about? We're going into November. That's when we're all thankful for things. And I am thankful that we stumbled upon a concept that you might say it can't lose. That's right, folks. We're bringing it back to Parker Lewis himself, the Fox cult hit that some people might consider was a bootleg Ferris Bueller, but I promise you more people identified with him than Matthew Broderick. That's right. We're going to get into it. Oh, this is this is a great show. So you can go check it out uh, wherever you can find it. The DVD sets are a little pricey, but you might have means to track it down. You might remember it really well. Maybe you got your old VHS copies you're going to check out. But either way, yeah, we're both super excited to talk about Parker Lewis Can't Lose. We're going to synchronize our swatches and be back soon. But in the meantime, if you want to find out what we're up to, you can find me at Hoju Coolander on all the social Social medias that you know if you want to find out what i'm up to will where can they get in touch with you you can find me everywhere at william b west that is x oh hate calling it that that's tiktok that is what are we on now blue sky um that is williambrucewest.com which will redirect to westweekever.com so you can find me at all these places that's right but hey don't forget to wear some reflective clothing whether you're out there trick-or-treating bring your flashlight but get some good scares in while you can we'll see you next time <laughs>